Right, hello year 10, I hope you're well. Uh, this is sort of a new way of trying to teach things, uh, it's a little bit different and it's my first time doing it so please give me some feedback on it. If there's any issues, let me know straight away. Uh, what I'm going to take you through today is um, our theories and how they developed for the structure of an atom. This is part of the new unit we're going to cover today, or this next couple of weeks, which is P5. Okay, so. Lesson objective, describe the evidence for a structure of the atom. Please feel free to stop these slides at any point if you need to read through them a little bit more carefully or if you want to take any notes. So your first task that I want you to do is I want you to see if you can recall what an atom looks like. So I want you to draw a picture in your book or whatever you've got to hand and label it. And secondly, I want you to name three types of radiation. Think back to P1, a unit that you did in year nine. I know that was a long time ago and a lot's happened since then. Let's see what you can remember. Okay, pause the video, give yourself two minutes to do that. Okay, hopefully you've managed it. Well, here's the answers. And this is what uh, Atom basically looks like. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than this, but this is the, the basics uh, for GCSE level, if you like. So an atom has got a nucleus in the center, which is made up of protons and neutrons, and they're surrounded by electrons, which orbit around the nucleus. The three types of radiation are alpha, beta, and gamma. Don't worry if you don't recall them. There will be a letter lesson later on in this unit all about them. So, first task. Fast forward this. Thank you. This is an image of an atom. I think it's a copper atom, but I'm glad to be corrected if anybody wants to correct me on it. Um, it's not really a photograph, it's a composite of uh, information that they've gathered from something like an electron microscope or a very, very high powered microscope. And as you can see, it can't see the individual electrons flying around because they orbit in things called shells, but you can sort of make out a nucleus in yellow right in the center there. And it's a lot more complicated looking than the image that you guys have just drawn in your books. And that's because our knowledge of what an atom is has come a long way in the last. 120, 130 odd years. So I'm going to walk you through over the next couple of slides some information about that because what we really want you to think about is that how scientific ideas get developed because we can make observations on most things but there's a lot of things we can't actually see occur particularly in physics we can't see an atom we can't look inside the nucleus of an atom but we can make observations about the effect that atom has on the world and come up with some sort of theories about what it might look like. I mean, a good analogy, if you want to think about it, is if you pick up a present that's been wrapped, if you pick it up at Christmas Day or your birthday or whatever, before you open it, you might be able to work out what's inside, or at least make a good guess, just from observations, maybe the size of it, maybe the sound it makes, maybe its weight. And that's basically how scientific theory works. Okay, You make observations from the things that you can observe, and then you apply your knowledge to it. Okay. And then you keep that until you, something comes along to change your mind. Maybe more evidence. Okay. Uh, so these theories of what an atom looks like have been ongoing for a long, long time, as we're going to demonstrate. I'm going to walk, introduce you to some of the main characters. There's a lot of people involved in developing the theory of atomic structure, but some of the main characters have been involved along the way. The first one I'll introduce you to is this uh, guy called Democrates. Democrates was a Greek philosopher. He lived two and a half thousand years ago and he asked himself could you divide matter into ever smaller pieces or was there a limit to the number of times a piece of matter could be divided. Now you remember he could not have tested this. Not possible. He had to do everything in theory in his head if you like and his theory that he came up with was that you couldn't. There must have been a point where you got to the smallest possible piece and you couldn't divide it anymore and he named that piece a Thomas, which means could not be cut, and that's where our name, Atom, comes from. So, thanks to the Dark Ages and the fall of the Roman Empire, this was pretty much forgotten for the best part of 2,000 years, until humans and society developed the resources to allow people to work on scientific theory and art and things like that, instead of trying to build things and uh, grow things and to survive in the field. And that age is called the Age of Enlightenment, around about the 16th, 17th century. And one of the people I'd like you to draw your attention to is this guy called John Dalton, who was a chemist, and he was one of the early chemists. And he came up with uh, 
one of the earlier theories about what atoms are, moving on from Democritus' theory that atoms were the smallest particles. So he deduced, he came up with a theory that all elements were composed of atoms, and that atoms of the same element were exactly alike. Atoms of different elements were different, obviously. So an oxygen atom was unique and a carbon atom was unique as well and if you form the two together you could get a compound so that was one of the earlier ideas it gave people this idea that there was a smaller building block to matter and to the world and people obviously want to go and investigate this a little bit more so the next individual that i introduce you to is jj thompson and jj thompson was a physicist in 1897 i think he worked in cambridge but i stand corrected if that's wrong and he started to work out whether atoms were possibly made of something smaller. And he did this very famous experiment where he passed electricity through a gas. And the gas had no charge in it. And as he passed the current through the gas, it gave off a ray of negatively charged particles. And he was quite surprised by this. Where did these negative charged particles come from? And his great leap of thought, his genius idea was that these negative charges came from within the atom. Remember, we didn't think there was anything smaller than an atom, so this is a big leap in human thought that there's something inside an atom, and it's negatively charged as well. And this proved, well, for all intents and purposes, that the atom was divisible. Now, he gave these tiny negatively charged particles a name. He called them corpuscles, which is an awful word. So we now know them as electrons. He also worked out that since the gas was known to be neutral and have no charge, because those electrons have been pushed away, something else must have been repelling them. And he reasoned that there must also be a positively charged particle inside the atom to push them away. But he could never find them. He could never find the evidence to prove it. So at the, he came up with this uh, theory. Uh, of a model of an atom, if you like. So what was inside an atom? And he proposed that he called it the plum pudding model. Now this stood for around about 20 odd years as being our definitive model of an atom. And he came up with the idea that it was a positively charged substance, like the cake in a plum pudding, and it's got negatively charged electrons scattered around it, like the raisins or the pieces of fruit that go into a plum pudding. So at this point, what I'd like you to do is stop what you're doing, pause the video, and have a crack at these three questions, and I'll give you the answers in a few minutes. Okay, hopefully you've got the answers to these. Uh, first one, what evidence did Democrates use to make his predictions on the structure of the atom, his own observations, and his previous knowledge of the world? <coughs> Sorry. Two, what were John Dalton's observations? He observed that all elements were composed of atoms and that each element had a unique atom and that if you joined more than one element together you formed a compound. And then finally, Dalton's plum pudding model, not Dalton, sorry, Thompson's plum pudding model. It was called a plum pudding model because he imagined an atom as being a positively charged blob with negatively charged electrons studded around inside it, a lot like the structure of a plum pudding. So that's kind of the history of uh, our knowledge of the structure of an atom, but it's not anything like we know what we know today. It was the basics, it was the grounding from which we came from. And obviously, once Thompson revealed that there is something inside an atom, people started getting very interested in maybe finding out a little bit more. And one of the biggest steps was the experiments performed by these three gentlemen here, running from left to right, on the left you have Rutherford, in the middle you have Geiger, and on the far right hand side you have Marsden. Geiger and Marsden, even though they look older than Rutherford, these pictures are all a little bit out of sync, the only ones I could find, Rutherford was actually in charge of the experiment, and Geiger and Marsden were his students at the time. They both went on to become Nobel Prize winning uh, physicists in their own right, and achieve amazing things in the area of uh, nuclear physics. But at the time, Rutherford was the man in charge and he came up with an experiment to try and test Thompson's plum pudding model and this is what the experiment looked like. <coughs> so what they did was they had a room uh, with a container inside of it that had a vacuum inside. All the air had been pumped out. 
inside the container with the vacuum they placed a source of alpha particles so that's a radioactive source that emitted alpha particles and they put it inside a metal box which you can see on here is labeled as being the shield okay the shield was metal the whole way around except for a very very tiny hole in it the reason for the tiny hole was so that the alpha particles had only one route of escape which means they came out of that shield in a very straight line okay it's just as a line of alpha particles and then they could direct the direction that the radiation was coming out in because as you will learn in later units radiation from a radioactive source actually emits in all directions so this is their way of controlling it making a, a beam if you like of alpha particles and what they fired those alpha particles was or at a very thin piece of gold foil they used gold atoms it's relatively stable and quite large but they used gold atoms to try and test this plum pudding theory okay and what they thought would happen was that the alpha particles would just pass straight through and that to detect this they used zinc sulfide screens which they call microscopes the far side of the very thin gold foil you can see them here on the right hand side when an alpha particle hits that zinc sulfide screen it will glow green so Geiger and Marston's job because Rutherford was far too important for this, I'm sure he was a very busy man, but he gave Geiger and Marston the job of counting the tiny green flashes on the zinc sulfide screen every time an alpha particle hit. That is an incredibly boring and laborious job. They would have had to sit in a dark room for hours by hand recording it. Today, we have computers that do all this sort of stuff. But back then, this would have meant hours and hours and hours of painstaking work. So what they found was that when they sent off the alpha particles it did indeed flash green on the screen on the far side so so far so good pretty much exactly as they expected so they decided to move the microscopes to different angles around the gold foil <coughs> just to see if anything would happen and they repeated the experiment again firing alpha particles at this gold foil and picking out and what they actually found was that some of the alpha particles, not all, some, were scattered at angles less than 90 degrees. But they kind of expected that as well. They thought there'd be some bouncing around and moving around in different places. So when they were reviewing the experiment, Rutherford suggested, after looking at all the results, why don't you put the microscope behind the gold foil? Marston and Geiger really didn't agree with them. They thought it would be a complete waste of time because all their evidence so far seems to point to uh, proving Thompson's plum polymer pudding model but Rutherford's in charge he says what well, he says goes and uh, they moved the microscope to behind it and guess what they found and I mean this is the laborious part they found that one in every 8,000 particles actually bounced off the gold atoms and came backwards which absolutely blew their mind they really weren't expecting that so they handed the results to Professor Rutherford to try and explain what was going on and he spent a lot of time thinking of it. So if you remember, up until then, Rutherford's experiment, it was thought that the atom looked like plum pudding, so electrons and negative, uh, negative plums, if you like, embedded in a ball of positive pudding. And this model just didn't fit with Rutherford and Geiger and Marston's observations of, atom, of uh, alpha particles being bounced back they were hitting something inside and this is what Rutherford found out and this diagram is a little bit hard to follow at the top you can see the black dots are alpha particles and you can see two moving straight through which is the ones that would have been detected right the other side of the gold foil and that some are deflected which they also expected and then if you look at the one in the middle that alpha particle being bounced back that's what he sort of decided he, he, their, their observation and what Rutherford realized was that there must be something inside an atom that was quite big that every so often if an alpha particle was lucky enough to collide with it it would bounce straight back off which means it had mass and all the other alpha particles were just passing straight through which was what was probably just air just space so he concluded that a nucleus an atom sorry I should say must have a large nucleus in the middle and then be generally surrounded by a lot of space with these electrons which don't really have much mass surrounding on the outside and this totally changed our understanding of what an atom looks like 
and we came up with this image you see on the left hand side of the structure of an atom. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to link a video to this which explains it a little bit differently, gives you a visual example of what the experiment looks like, although it's a modern version of it, it's pretty much the same, same idea. Because for your GCSEs you need to be able to describe the experiment and <coughs> describe their observations as well. So to help you with this, um, this is the, an extended piece of writing for this unit, okay? And what I want you to do is I want you to imagine you're a journalist and you've been asked to write an article about Rutherford and his nuclear model of the atom. Uh, the article is titled Ernest Rutherford, the Nuclear Atom. And what you need to do is describe his observations, explain his observations, describe his nuclear model, model for the atom, but also make Rudf uh, explain what makes Rudford's theory a good scientific explanation. I'm not going to leave you hanging with just that. There is also a mark scheme which is attached to the PowerPoint as well. Please read through it carefully and go through it in detail. So that's everything for this lesson. Uh, I hope it makes sense. You can rewind, you can play back different sections of it. I've also attached a PowerPoint which goes with this and that video that I spoke of. Um, if you have any issues, please do get back to me. Thank you.